right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our latest webinar series titled What Every Executive Should Know. In this series, we invite industry leaders and experts to have candid conversations about specific projects, topics, and challenges they face in data within their industry today. So be sure to follow along. We have our previous webinars covering topics on data science and another on digital transformation that can be found in our webinar archive on our website. And then today we will be covering modern data warehouses, what they are, how to get your project off the ground, how to create an iterative development, and of course, how to get people to use it. A few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and the recording as well as any resources mentioned will be emailed to you in the next few days. And additionally, we are having a lightning round at the end of this webinar and I'll let Dave explain this a little more, but feel free to go ahead and prep any questions you have to ask our presenters and put them in the chat as we go along. With that, I know we have a jam packed session for you today. And we are being conscious of time, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's speakers. Today we have Technion's National Sales Director with more than 20 years of firsthand experience designing and implementing data warehouses. Michael Tantrum understands the real world challenges that data warehousing teams face. Through roles as developer, architect, and consultant, Michael has helped scores of companies improve their data warehousing processes, including organization, organizations such as Vodafone, Air New Zealand, Union Bank, Costco, and Expedia. In interviewing Michael today, we have Technion Senior Sales Executive with many years experience around data and analytics in various roles and industries and true data enthusiast, the great Dave Haas. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to you, Dave. Thank you, Rachel. Awesome introductions. I know we had a ton of folks register for this session on modern data warehouses and um, I think it's interesting because whether you are with an organization, a large organization that has had to go through a major data transformation that you probably haven't done in over a decade, or maybe you're with a smaller company that is just starting to move to the cloud, the core problem for, for both of these groups of folks is identical. It's the same. Modernizing a data warehouse is an incredibly daunting task. So today we are interviewing a guy who essentially has spent most of his career building out data warehouses. He's got 20 plus years of experience doing it and just has a wealth of knowledge to share with us today. So super excited to get moving on that. But before we jump in, let me just share with you kind of where we're going. Um, I know that we did a pre meeting survey and many of you got back to us, which was amazing. Thank you so much for the feedback. Um, but um, the top things that you guys talked about needing, um, number one was why. So why do you need a modern data warehouse? Actually 79% of you had chosen that as one of your selections. Um, next up was common mistakes. So big problems. And we had roughly 50% of you select um, really a focus around covering some of the big problems that you're seeing. And then finally, 36% um, had an interest in iterative development. So we're going to talk a little bit about iterative development as well. Now, if one of these three topics wasn't in your top list of top choices, do not worry. Um, as Rachel mentioned, we are going to be doing a lightning round towards the end. So start thinking of your questions. We are going to bombard Michael with all types of different questions, whether they be technical uh, business or maybe a mix of both. So feel free to dive in, ask away, drop them in the chat as we're speaking, and we will be sure that we get a chance to cover all of those. So with that, Michael, I think the best place for us to start is around a definition. Could you perhaps help us define exactly what a modern data warehouse is for our audience? Yeah, sure. So thanks, Dave. Um, so uh, most of you on the call will be familiar with the concepts of data warehousing. And the, the question is, you know, how does a traditional data warehouse differ from a modern data warehouse? Uh, and 
there's not really one core definition, but there are themes that tend to occur in the modern data warehouse space. The first most logical one uh, is that traditional warehouses have been on premise. So they've been your classic, you know, your SQL servers, your appliances like your Teradata's, unit teasers, et cetera. The modern data warehouse almost overwhelmingly is going to the cloud. And whatever um, flavor of cloud you use, whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, Google, uh, whichever databases, but the, the overriding theme is moved to the cloud. Uh, the next thing that seems to be thematic is the frequency of refresh. So traditionally, uh, we used to get away with an overnight, sometimes weekly, uh, refresh of data. The modern uh, data warehouse is uh, moving towards uh, more frequent intraday and even towards real time uh, refreshes. So um, not always, not all data requires this and not all uh, organizations desire this, uh, but certainly that this is the trend. Uh, another theme is data sources. So traditionally data sources were relatively straightforward. Originally we, we worked with files um, and relational data sources. Uh, um, the modern uh, uh, data warehouse has a lot more types of sources. So web APIs, um, you know, we've still got the traditional, but we've got things like web APIs, we have IoT, we have SaaS services, a lot more uh, variety of sources, uh, you know, sensor data and things like that. Um, another theme uh, that we see, the traditional warehouse often was very manual in the way it was developed. So if we look at the development style, uh, it was quite manual. Uh, a modern data warehouse should uh, contain a reasonably high degree of automation. And automation has many faces. It could be uh, um, design automation. It, it could be uh, development, development automation. It could be uh, documentation. It could be uh, deployment automation. It could be CICD. Um, it could be... Um, uh, data governance automation, testing automation, but automation should form a core part of a modern data warehouse. Uh, the um, Traditionally, of course, our data warehouses were just your classic um, databases, um, but the modern data warehousing landscape also includes elements of data lake. And uh, you get all these various hybrid models, you'll start to hear of things like Lakehouse, and, uh, and data shorehouse and things like that. So a mixing of uh, the concept of a data lake. We've had data lakes around for a while, but the role was always as a repository of data, not necessarily forming part of your core analytic landscape. So that, that's one of the things there. The final thing I'd mentioned, Dave, is data governance. In a traditional data warehouse space, data governance was almost an afterthought. It was a nice to have, it was, if I actually managed to get everything else done, then I would think about data governance. A modern data warehouse data governance um, is being built in from the beginning by design. And so um, it's quite a, quite a different approach. People are now demanding to be able to say, what is my data? Where does it come from? How did it get there? Can I trust it? Uh, can I... Um, uh, you know, is it of good quality uh, uh, and such? So uh, those are probably the main identifying uh, features, I would say, of a modern data warehouse. Excellent start. It gives us a good framework to build on. So let's just dive right into it from there, Michael. Um, let's talk about why you actually need a modern data warehouse. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good question. So the, um, the need for analytics is only going one way. And those of you who do this for a job, you know what your in-tray is like. You know the requests from your users uh, for, for more uh, variety of data, for more types of analyses, uh, for frequency, for complexity. Uh, that's, that's only going one way. Uh, and so we need, as IT professionals, as data engineering professionals, we need to be able to adapt. And it's always been our problem. We've struggled to adapt in the traditional sense. We have to be able to uh, adapt much, much faster in the, in the, modern, in the modern world. Uh, 
So the increase in data, increase in types of data. Uh, the other thing is cost. So the cost of infrastructure in the cloud uh, makes a lot of the traditional approaches um, very expensive. And as your uh, existing data warehouses reach end of life, so your servers, um, your software and data where a database platform licenses start to come up for renewal, it's a good opportunity to say, can we make a step change in the cost of our data warehousing? So the cost of cloud storage is dropped through the floor. Uh, the cost of infrastructure of managing data centers is really cheap. Uh, and it becomes a question from a, from, a, from a personnel point of view, from a cost, from a security, from a hardware point of view, does it make sense to do it uh, on premise anymore? And so the cloud is driving a, a huge opportunity for people to consider is now the time to rework and modernize my warehouse. The final thing is your end users are getting increasingly sophisticated. In the past, they would have been okay with a dashboard or maybe some reports. Now they're wanting integrated analytics. They're wanting uh, analytics with, with workflows that change the way frontline people operate the business. Uh, and so uh, to adapt, we've got to go to, to new ideas. Excellent. Michael, I, I, I see this frequently and it's interesting as as we chat within Technion, we, we kind of tend to see four groupings of folks in their journey around this modern data uh, warehouse operation. And I think, you know, if we draw kind of a sector, it'd be kind of interesting to hear you talk a little bit um, about where you see people sitting. If we on one axis, perhaps, let's call this value of your data. And on this access, let's call it access to data. It'd be interesting to kind of get your perspective on each of these quadrants. Um, Michael, at the bottom right here, we, um, we have an area where you essentially are in a spot where you're not getting any value from your data today. You have a very difficult time accessing your data. Um, what might we call that? Yeah, um, I think most organizations, you'd probably call this something like the hurt zone. Uh, and uh, this is where, you know, your users are, because they can't get at data, they're running their analytics off spreadsheets, they're managing by instinct, you know, they're not using data driven decision making, um, they're not leveraging the data that they have. Uh, and uh, yeah, that, this, is, this is not a good place to be. They're not getting value uh, from the data in the organization. Uh, hopefully nobody on this call is there, although we do still see some companies, uh, particularly at the early stages um, down in the hurt zone here. Gotcha. Now, how about this top left zone, Michael, where people are accessing their data, but unfortunately they, they haven't modernized their data warehouse yet um, and they're not really seeing any value. Well, yeah, yeah. So, so we've, we've as uh, data people, we've pushed some data out to our users and in some form, you know, maybe through Tableau or uh, re static reports or, e or even, you know, nice websites, but they're not getting value from it. So what's happening here? We've got low engagement with our users. Um, probably uh, they haven't had a lot of input into what we built for them. Uh, they're not getting business value from it. Um, and uh, there's probably a lot of questions around what did we spend this money on? And so your issues here to, to try and move to a better place, you've got to say, how can we increase the engagement with our users uh, and, and answer the question, why don't they have value? Have we asked and answered the wrong question? Um, have we built a, a laboratory experiment rather than something the business actually needs? Um, I would call this, if I'm going to give this a name, let's call this the access zone. I've got access to data, but I'm not really doing much, you know, getting any value from it. Excellent, excellent. And, and as we go through these, Michael, I'll ask the audience, if you care to share, drop in chat, if you resonate with any of these zones and where you guys actually are, it'd be interesting to, to kind of take a look at that. So Michael, let's go towards the bottom right zone. Again, I, I think this is kind of a, a yellow zone, well, for lack of 
better words, but what might you call this zone and what are some of the characteristics of the folks? Yeah. That see so this is where the business users, they're getting a lot of value from the data, but they just can't get at it or can't get at it well. So maybe we'll call this the, the I don't know, let's call this the desperation zone. And so here, what you guys will see is your users spending a lot of time assembling and manipulating data. Uh, now, we don't want them to do that. We want them to focus on making decisions and using data to, to drive the business. We don't want them having to assemble and manipulate it. Uh, and so you will see people trying to use desktop blending tools like uh, Altrix if they're, if they're a bit smart. They'll be trying to use their own copies of, of BI tools. They'll be using spreadsheets. They may even try and stand up their own sort of data marts in an attempt to get somewhere. But this is not what we want business users doing. We want business users running the business and letting the data professionals focus on the data side. Um, so again, this is not a great space to be. We want to increase access to data. This is where we want to be to be providing systematic and automated approaches to, to providing user access. All right, Michael, we've got a zone here to the top right. I'm gonna make this a green zone. It's a pretty good place to be. So let's talk about what some of the characteristics are and what you might call this zone. Yeah, good access to data. So we're supplying uh, repeatable, reliable, structured data to users to make uh, good decisions on. Um, they, um, they can rely on it. Um, we might call this a strategic zone. And this is probably where we all aspire to be. Um, we, um, we are getting value and uh, people feel like, um, yeah, uh, they, they, can make, they can make good business decisions based from this. But this is, um, and, and you think, okay, I'm in the strategic zone, I'm good, you know, high five, modern data warehousing, maybe I'm tweaking up some of the tooling underneath, but can I get better? Uh, so Dave, what can we what can we describe that as? Can we create maybe a yeah? Let's create a pocket in there. Let's call this the elite zone. And what does the elite zone look like? This is secure data. It's governed data. It's it's um, uh, highly reliable, um, well well populated. You're adding new data sources at the speed that business want to consume it. So. Um, this, this is probably where we want to aspire to. And what I'd actually encourage you all to think about here is think about these axes and maybe scale them from you know, one to 10 and grade yourself. How do you think your business users score on feeling about their access to data and the same with the value of data? Work out what zone you're in and maybe consider uh, where you'd like to go. And uh, we can talk about how we might help you move that uh, to the towards the, the green zone and then ultimately to the elite zone. Excellent. This, this is just a, a great kind of visualization, a way to kind of figure out, all right, as I'm planning my modernization project, my data transformation project, having a sense of where you are and how you're going to get there basically is, is so important, right? Um, just to start off. But from there, let's, let's transition a little bit and let's talk now about some of the common mistakes that you see folks making um, with this journey. And what I'm gonna do here, Michael, is I'm gonna draw, I call this my iceberg drawing. And if you would, if you could kind of talk about as the tip of the iceberg, some of the real common mistakes um, that people essentially make that, that are pretty easy to spot, and then perhaps underneath the water, let's talk about the ones that are not so easy to spot. Exactly, yeah. And like an iceberg, what seems obvious that seems to be the problem is not usually the problem. So if I'm looking uh, the the part of the iceberg above the waterline, so to speak, uh, the things that you would be noticing here is that you are struggling to deliver your projects on time. Uh, you're, you've got requirements which seem to be constantly changing and you're chasing your tail, trying to stay on top of it. Uh, you're doing a lot of rework. It just feels like you're forever doing re-engineering, just trying to get things right. Uh, you're struggling with unforeseen data quality issues and they just keep biting you. Uh, and your end users are not engaged uh, and can't be satisfied. 
And so often those are just the symptoms, but we look at them, we say, we've got to solve these. But the reality is if I drop uh, below the waterline, um, what I'm seeing is a different thing. What, what were the mistakes that I made that caused that to um, those things to be the case? Uh, well, first, um, I think the common one is you just didn't engage people who've done it before. So you're trying to build it yourself for the first time. You took a, a build um, versus buy approach. Now that also relates to people. You have the option to recruit uh, and hire expert hires who can help, uh, or you can use um, consulting firms like Technion. But the first problem was you, you didn't get people who, who've done it before and you're trying to do it yourself. Another thing uh, that could have happened is that you haven't put your best business analysts or your best subject matter experts onto the projects. Now these people fight joining data projects usually because they have a day job. And so we're asking them to give up some of their day job time to help us work on the project. And the other critical thing with these people is they must be empowered to make decisions on behalf of their business units about design. So if you have a question, I have this data, it doesn't look quite right, or how do I want it grouped or categorized or this business rule calculated, I need someone who can say, do it like this and not have to go back and consult a committee. If you do that, your project is doomed. So they've got to be empowered, smart people. Uh, other things you'll see, a lack of uh, attention to things like architectural standards. Um, you know, we talked about the standards up front, you know, design standards, development standards, documentation standards, deployment standards, operational standards, uh, lack of attention to standards at the beginning. Uh, also testing, a lack of uh, consideration of data testing and QA as a core part of your process. Um, probably you may not have made good choices around tooling. Uh, it's easy to get uh, seduced by, um, uh, by a tool without considering the wider context of um, what are the modern tools and how do they bring automation to the party. And I think the final thing which bites people is not taking an agile iterative um, project approach. But this is, um, still not the core of the problem. Um, Dave, can you draw me a, a, the bottom weighty part of this and make it a make it a red or something? We'll call this the kill the kill area. This is where the things that really kill projects and if they're not considered properly, everything above it is doomed to failure. And the key here is strong executive sponsorship and, uh, and a product champion. This has got to be as high up in the organization as possible. This has to be someone who uh, will marshal resources, will defend your project uh, at the board level, um, will make sure that the goals and uh, strategies of the company are aligned to the delivery. Uh, and so a big failure here is a lack of aligning to say, why am I building my warehouse? What is the business purpose? What do they need to run the business? And is my data warehouse aligned with those company objectives? Uh, another problem, is expectations. You know, it's a little bit like Goldilocks. Uh, how long is my project, is the state of warehouse going to project to be? You can set your expectations too short and you can set them too long. That's why I call it the Goldilocks problem. You've got to set it just right. Um, and so uh, if you don't get good expectations set, people get frustrated about cost overruns or delivery timelines. Um, you haven't considered an adoption strategy. You know, the uh, the saying, you know, build it and they will come. All too often we build it without considering whether people will come. And so c working with your end users about adoption um, is a critical, uh, critical component because otherwise if you build it and they don't use it, it's a white elephant. Okay, um, you've got to, yeah, you've got to build up their confidence that what they have is right. Um, the other thing I think is that people forget that this data warehouse you build is a living organism. It doesn't stop. There is no done. There is no end. Uh, and what that means is as you build, if people are using it, they're going to be asking for new subject areas, changes in business rules, additions, more frequent data. And, and that's a good sign because it tells you that people are using your warehouse. But what it also means is you have become the victim of your own success. And so 
don't consider I build it, then I'm done. You've got to plan for the life of this, this living beast and you've got to give it care and feeding throughout its life, you know, as it grows. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Michael. Um, before we hit the lightning round of questions, I do want to touch on iterative development for a few minutes. Um, could you talk to us about what that looks like and what people are doing today um, to get to where they need to be? Yeah, very good point. Okay. Um, so the classic mistake people make here is that they treat this like any other project. And so uh, they treat it like a staircase. So maybe draw me a staircase there, Dave, and I start on the bottom step and I say, right, what do I need to do? I need to gather some requirements. So gather the requirements, then I need to, haven't got the requirements, I come up with my uh, architecture and my approach and um, set up my environment, and then I do my build, and then I push it out for deployment. Okay, that sounds textbook uh, development project management. But here's the problem. You're dealing with analytics, you're dealing with people who cannot articulate good requirements. They can tell you the first problem they want to solve they cannot tell you the six questions that are gonna come out of that first answer. And so if you take this approach, firstly, they're not gonna be able to give you good requirements, but you, if you insist and you say, uh, you know, I can't build it if you don't tell me what you want. And so eventually they'll give you something um, and then you're gonna deploy it, you're gonna put it into a user acceptance testing environment. The user's gonna look at it and they're gonna say, ah, now that I see it, can I have some changes? And you're going to have to go all the way down the staircase, so you're going to update go your up. requirements, new yeah. requirements, changing requirements, rebuild, and you're running up and down the staircase and it becomes exhausting uh, because um, uh, there's just so many moving pieces to have to, to work with. And that's a hard way of doing a data warehouse. It's the right way to build an operational system or maybe a website or something like that. But the, the right approach to dealing with data warehousing is an iterative approach. And so with an iterative approach, you start with an idea. A user will come to me and say, I need something like this. And often, and people laugh at me for this, I will give them a whiteboard marker and say, draw what you think you need. So I'll take that idea and I'm gonna and that they've drawn and I'm gonna build a prototype. So the first step is, um, so uh, give me a give me a little circle, we'll call this an idea, and then I'm gonna build a prototype. Uh, now, once I've got that prototype, and this prototype, I should, if it takes me more than a few days to build, then it's not a prototype. Uh, I'm going to put this in front of my user. I'm going to call them back into the room, throw it up on the big screen, or <laughs> throw it on the Zoom screen in a COVID world, uh, and I'm going to iterate that with them. I'm going to sit them down beside me, maybe figuratively in a COVID world, and I'm going to iterate. And I'm going to say, okay, what do you see there? what needs changes and they're going to refine their requirements as I redo the building and eventually they're going to say what you have on the screen right there that that's what I want and we'll say okay now I'm going to deploy that and so step number four is into a deploy and then we go back into the idea cycle and this concept of um, what I would call conference room development is the only way to help my users refine their requirements, but in a way that I'm able to manage my development process. So prototype iterate um, is a highly effective way of, um, of developing data warehouses. I will say to make the iteration effective, you have to have the right tooling. And there are a variety of uh, modern automation tools out there that with code automation, uh, modeling automation, and things like that. Um, we've got lots of ideas. You guys may be using some of them, uh, depending on whether you're building data vaults or um, more traditional Kimball warehouses. There's all sorts of options there. But you've got to consider automation tools, because otherwise your iteration cycles take too long. Excellent. Excellent. Michael, any before we dive into lightning rounds, uh, we have about a minute, two minutes left. Any good stories that you want to share? Uh, yeah, um, let's let's. I'll share a story about the requirements gathering. So um, I was once asked to help a large bank uh, build out an HR data warehouse, and uh, they had spent eighteen months having workshops with all their users. They'd been advised by um, one of the um, 
uh, the big consulting firms, you have to build this requirement thing. So they had all these workshops, they created this uh, requirements document that I would say was probably about two and a half inches thick. And they, they said, right, Michael, can you come in and uh, build this for us? And they handed me this requirements document. And what I did, and I, I didn't do this consciously, but I took their requirements document, I turned, I put it to the side, and I said, right, tell me what we're going to build. And there was this look of horror on their face, because they had spent 18 months creating this document. And I said, no, let's start with the core, you draw me a picture of what you want. And they humored me, they drew a picture and, and we took this prototype iterate approach. I located my desk in the center of the HR call center. And in the cubicles around me, I had the HR director, I had the, the source system expert, their data payroll and HR system data expert. Um, the call center leader of the, H, of the HR team was there. And every time there was a question, you know, I'd say, what about this? You've asked for this. Here's the data. It doesn't quite make sense. It would be like meerkats at the zoo popping their heads above their cubicles. Chatter, chatter, chatter. Two minute discussion. We get an answer. We go back. And we brought that project in 75% of budget. So we came in um, with uh, in three quarters of the time. And the reason was highly empowered users, iterative development, requirements evolved uh, based on real data and real need. And at the end, they looked at the original requirements document, they looked at what we built and said, there's not much overlap at all. But what they had was exactly what they wanted. I love it. I love it. Well, Michael, that brings us to the lightning round. And I do have some questions coming in, which is fantastic. So let's just dive right into it. Um, Arlandis asks, what are some legislative concerns one might consider when developing a data warehouse for a particular business unit? Yeah, uh, a very common problem, particularly in the modern data warehousing space. So if you're in healthcare, you've got to be concerned about HIPAA. Um, if you are in uh, finance, you've got all sorts of regulatory issues around there. Uh, if you are in Europe, you've got GDPR, or if you do business in Europe, the whole question around how do I, you know, the right to be forgotten and things like that. Uh, California has some rules around that as well. So um, you've got to consider uh, those now. Um, those are the, the kind of concerns. There are different modeling techniques you can take to doing that. Um, and and such, but uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. These are things you have to have to consider um, when you're building your architectural framework. These are the time to design some of these in. And I have to say, if you're dealing with the GDPR, uh, considering something like a Data Vault is a great way to be able to record when data was was captured and and to be able to dispose of it if necessary. All right, I have another question from Orlandis. These are good ones. Keep them coming, Orlandis. Um, what are tips for convincing an enterprise board to buy in or to provide capital towards your data warehouse? Very good question. It is hard to calculate ROI up front. And so um, you can, uh, the best you can do is you can say uh, something like, what is my next best alternative? If I don't build this data warehouse, how are you going to gather that data to be able to make your decisions to manage your, your business unit? Um, you can attempt to uh, minimize the risk by taking an agile approach, that uh, prototype iterate design we talked about. Uh, the idea in doing agile is that I'm continuously delivering new pieces every two to three weeks, whatever my sprint cycle is. And that way people feel like they're getting early delivery so that they're getting value, they're not having to wait two years before they get something. Um, and uh, also if you decide, okay, stop, we've now run out of funds, then you, you've at least got something built. Maybe it's 70%, maybe it's 90%, maybe it's 110%, but at least you've, you've got things built. Um, but that is a very good question, uh, how to deal with the ROI. Excellent. I'm loving these lightning round questions. Um, have a great one from Robert. Robert, hello, glad you joined us today. Um, Robert asks, asks, is there a golden rule about distribution of user roles in a warehouse environment? Number of admins relative to number of users, et cetera. Oh, that is so, situ one. yeah, it's so situation dependent. Um, 
some of this is cultural. I have been into traditional organizations where they have insisted on demarcated roles. There's data modelers, there is administrators, there's DBAs, there's developers, there's uh, business analysts. And when you say to people, a modern warehouse, you actually have to take a slice across there. We need people who are cross-functional. I need a business analyst who might also be able to look at data and code. I need a, a developer who's willing to talk to a user. And so when you talk about taking a slice across those roles, some people get a bit, a bit nervous. Um, so I would, uh, I don't know that I would say I have a golden rule, but what I would say is consider the cross-functional nature of the teams that you put together. And I've even had a case where I've had a, a bright end user, he was an accountant, and we taught him basic SQL, and we brought him onto the project team, and he was able to triage uh, um, data quality issues as we were building, and because he was the only guy who knew that it was a data quality issue. So um, yeah, cons consider that cross-functional approach there, I think. Excellent, excellent. I've got one from Maureen. Um, where do BI tools fit into improving engagement? We have users using Power BI, and when they see the dashboards that can be created, they are now demanding more data, which <laughs> is exactly what you said earlier in the, in the call. However, it, it seems that Power BI almost has users creating another later layer of data warehouse. Thoughts exactly, yeah. And so you've got to ask the question, what's the question behind the question? Why are they asking for more data? Is it because your team is too slow turning around the additions that they want? Um, are they um, are they having that situation of I answered my first question, but now I have more questions and I need to iterate through those? So there might be an engagement problem. Um, it's also a sign that you're doing well because you're actually delivering them data to have forced them to ask more questions. So I might consider think about how you're engaging with your users there, bring them into the project team, uh, make them part of the solution, try and avoid an us versus them, we IT, them the users, try and create a us together, IT and the user together creating this new, these new um, analyses. Excellent. I see Shruti um, dropped into the chat. Hello Shruti, hope you are well. Um, she said, hi, Michael, I cannot agree more about how users are not able to give good requirements about an analytics task. So you've got a little bit of a, of a backup there from Shruti. Oh, thank you, Shruti. Yes. Uh, the classic thing you often hear is, you know, the, 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 you say, uh, if you don't tell me what you want, I can't build it. And they go, they have this rabbit in the headlights look, and then they say, well, give me everything. And you say, well, you can't have everything. You end up in this protracted negotiation. That's the wrong place to be. Excellent. Um, I have got one more here and we will wrap it up, Michael. Um, David asks, can you give an example of a client you've helped um, build a modern data warehouse and how did it make their life easier? I think you did give a good example a little bit earlier, but how did it make the life easier, Michael? Yeah, a really good example. Um, we had a client that was on a traditional on-premise appliance, uh, one of the big MPP appliances. They had maxed this, uh, this box out. And their option was, uh, do we upgrade to the newest box um, or do we take this as an opportunity to, uh, to look at a modernizing of our stack? And the cost of moving to the next uh, appliance was going to be about a million dollars. And they said, okay, for that sort of money, now's the time to consider. And they said, okay, well, let's look at cloud. What do we save by going to the cloud? Our administrative uh, roles dr dr dramatically reduced. I don't need so many DBAs, infrastructure people. I don't have to worry about disaster recovery and things like that. That's all managed by cloud infrastructure. Uh, secondly, the cost. It was very cheap to start up. When I was doing development at the beginning on this cloud environment, I was only paying for the small amount of resource I was using. And it wasn't until I deployed to production that I was paying full, full production workloads. So that was um, that was the next thing. Uh, the third thing was tooling. They had got. They were using a very handcrafted traditional ETL approach using one of the, the classic uh, ETL tools. And we said, you need to be looking at automation. Uh, and we, we found them a data warehouse automation tool. And this allowed them to automatically generate code and automatically manage DDL structures, automatically manage documentation and lineage, a lot of the more straightforward um, 
data governance functions around business glossary and also automation around QA and testing. That's an area that people constantly forget to incorporate. And by adding these automation tools, uh, the development timelines came right down. The errors, um, when we were constantly deploying to QA and then to production, reduced down to uh, almost nothing. And in fact, um, using the QA automation, we were able to do a deployment of six and a half thousand database objects in a single deployment without a single issue. And to that point, I had never ever seen a deployment of that scale go perfectly without issues. So uh, just to, you know, as, as a story of hope and confidence for you, uh, these things are possible. Awesome. Well, that is our time, Michael. Thank you so much. Rachel, I'm going to hand it back over to you. I believe you have um, some follow-up questions for the folks that are here and yes, we'll wrap it up. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Michael. I know this is a quick session, so we're going to throw up a quick poll um, for you guys if you could take just a moment to uh, fill that out. And um, again, today's session was recorded and will be emailed to you in the next day or so. And uh, just a quick plug to mark your calendars for our next webinar in this series. It will be on April 21st. And we will be interviewing the founder of Go to Market, Susan Schramm. And she'll be talking about how to de-risk your data transformation projects. And I'll just throw the link up in the chat real quick so that you guys can check that out. But thank you again, Dave and Michael, and thank you guys for joining us today. Feel free to reach out to us with any additional questions you may have, and we hope to see you guys next time. Mm -hmm.